Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Sarit Zahavi, the president of the Alma Research and Education Center, which specializes on Israel's security challenges on its northern border, join us to discuss, is war between is Israel and Hezbollah imminent? Mrs. Zahavi will speak for 15 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A from the audience. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Sarit Zahavi. Hi, good evening, everybody. It's evening here in Israel. I wanted to start by uh, saying a few words about Alma Center, which I founded a few years ago. In Alma Center, we focus on uh, Israel security challenges on the northern border. And we're actually making our research on the northern border from the northern border. We are based 12 kilometers uh, from the Israeli-Lebanese border. Uh, our research is based on various uh, Arabic sources, social media and media, um, that we have professional Arabic media researchers that know how to find very specific information that we're looking for. And we find out, and since we all have uh, experience with military intelligence, we can provide information that uh, basically was not provided until today or not in the way we are doing that, combining uh, terrain analysis with textual analysis and that way uh, bringing you know to the front of the stage if I can put it this way uh, some more information about um, military capabilities of Hezbollah and other Iranian proxies uh, in the region and also in Iran itself and you're invited all to visit us I'll put the link later on this was in very brief and I want to start with the report that we just published last week about the advanced uh, weapon industry in Syria, named CELS. Um, two main conclusions for a very long report, which I'm not going to elaborate now. One is that, that the chemical uh, industry, weapon industry in Syria still exists, alive and kicking, uh, even though uh, there were uh, different kind of uh, announcement that maybe Syria was disarmed, this is not happening. Um, and we assess that maybe this kind of capabilities also ended up in the hands of Hezbollah and Lebanon. Another thing that we've seen here is that Iran is gradually taking over this industry, uh, which is composed of many institutions spread all over Syria, uh, especially when we speak about one uh, institution named the uh, 4000, where uh, the PGMs, precision guided missiles, are being manufactured, which actually enables the Iranians to what we call shorten the corridor, shorten the smuggling of weapons all the way from Iran through Iraq into Syria and there, and from there either to distribute it to the various proxies of Iran, including, and of course, the main one is Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. Um, I think that what I've just said is actually demonstrating the, the basic uh, uh, vision of Iran, of creating more involvement in the region and creating a multi-front campaign against Israel, uh, Syria and Lebanon, we are already there. And I think this was exemplified uh, in the past year and a half when we speak about the Israeli-Lebanese border. We see uh, physically on the border, when we, we are there almost every day, uh, we see how this border is changing. You know, if we have met at the border like two, three years ago, and I would have told you that Hezbollah is on my border, you just had to believe me. Now you don't need to believe me. I can just uh, share some examples with you. I hope the technology will be with me. Uh, you can see this is a Hezbollah military operative dressed in uniforms, taking photos of IDF, uh, by the way, an IDF tank that, that was there. Uh, nearby, uh, this is a patrol of Hezbollah that I took a year ago when I was in a, with a group at the border, and they just pop out of the bushes, and all of a sudden they were walking there next to the fence, so the, the person with his back is actually an Israeli. Uh, Hezbollah operatives taking photos of me. This is the uh, positions of Hezbollah in name Green Without Borders. It's actually a, a kind of an, a, a cover organization uh, environment organization, it's not truly an environment organization, the military operative that you see here and the photo is a commando, a combatant of Hezbollah, and this place is exactly 
where the two soldiers were kidnapped in 2006. It's the same place. Uh, another one, I guess you can, you get my point. Uh, this video I, I myself took uh, in the Israeli Independent Day. And this was a kind of a patrol that they did to get to know the sector. We saw them pointing at different areas in Israel. Uh, so as you can see, sometimes they are dressed in uniforms, sometimes they are dressed in civilian clothing, sometimes they have masks to hide their faces. And each time they take photos of, of either IDF uh, forces that are on defense or myself. Um, look, below the surface, something is happening, as I've said, not, not only what we see on the border. And I think that in order to understand all of that, we need to go back to around a year ago to the maritime border dispute and later maritime border agreement. And the fact that eventually what happened is that Hezbollah said very, very clearly, the leader of Hezbollah said very, very clearly, either there is an agreement or there is war. And Israel chose, chose an agreement. Israel chose to get the gas uh, in, the mar in the area of dispute, to get the gas out of the sea and actually made a concession and agreed to the Lebanese position in the past decade. Uh, we got the gas, we are using the gas, and uh, we harvest the gas. Uh, searches for gas in the Lebanese side are also, uh, as we speak, just uh, now in, the, in their beginnings, I'll put it this way. Uh, but uh, we also send a message to Hezbollah that, okay, under a lot of pressures, we made a concession. Uh, since then, in the past few months, we have seen, uh, people call it provocation, I call it also provocation, it was also terrorist attacks. When 36 rockets are launched from Lebanon uh, into Israel uh, and intercepted of my home, and I had 30 guests at home, this is my small personal story in this, that's not provocation, that's a terrorist attack. Uh, when you have an infiltration of a terrorist with a lot of explosives on his way um, to kill Israelis and luckily failed, this is not a provocation. Two anti-tank missiles that are being launched to a a uh, village on the border, which I will elaborate on this very special incident. Uh, and yes, endless provocations, endless provocations. If you truly want to get the true picture, I'm just reading now the UNIFIL report uh, about the past six months. I've never seen such a report with hundreds, hundreds of violations of, of uh, the blue line crossings, using guns, and, uh, even the uh, openings of what they call the openings in the ground. I'm asking myself whether these are channels as well. Uh, and, and, and and it's unified report. It's not even Israeli. Uh, in other words, we see that Hezbollah is willing to take to take much more risks on the borderline than it used to. It used to be much more careful in the past. And uh, the current development is around the land border. I mentioned the maritime border. I want to talk about uh, the land border, and for doing that, I want to show you the map. Um, so when Israel had withdrawn from Lebanon in May 2000, the United Nations acknowledged our withdrawal, uh, but the Lebanese said we have reservations, which you can see on my map, uh, marked in red. Uh, in one of these areas, uh, which is uh, truly problematic, it's inside a town named Raja, 3,000 people living in Raja. Uh, by the way, they are Alawites, uh, like the Syrian government, but they are loyal. Israeli citizens, and uh, when the UN marked the border uh, in 2000, in May 2000, it actually marked it in the middle of the town, meaning that the southern part of the town is an area that we took from Syria in 1967, and we annexed it uh, in 1981. And as I've said, these people are Israeli citizens. And uh, the northern part of the town is considered Lebanese, uh, but all of it is under the control of the state of Israel. So uh, two months ago or three months ago when Hezbollah planted a few tents, uh, by the way, in the same area over here in my map, uh, that are crossing what is called the blue line in a violation of the, the, the international agreements, Lebanon and Hezbollah immediately opened a campaign and said, okay, but Israel is violating much more. Israel is taking over the northern part of Raja, uh, which is correct, but we cannot abandon the Israeli citizens. It is clear it's a humanitarian issue in opposed to all other areas along the blue line which are not involved uh, with people. Here, these are people involved and it's truly a, a problem. 
to evacuate the northern part of the town and to follow the international resolutions of the UN. I think that, uh, you know, it's funny, it's been 17 years since the, it's exactly, by the way, 17 years since the previous war. Uh, it's exactly 17 years since uh, the ceasefire of the previous war started, August 14, 2006. And in the, in the 15 years after the war, we felt that it was kind of a status quo. There are a little bit of provocation, a little bit of, of presence next to the border. Sometimes here and there things happened and there were lock, rocket launching uh, from Lebanon against Israel, but nothing was like the reality that we are experiencing today. And I think that the main question is, what changed? How come we see Hezbollah taking much more risks? And of course, where this is heading? Uh, and, and I will give a few reasons, and I want to start from Hezbollah itself. You know, these are eventually these are young military operatives, um, young military operatives that uh, were involved in this in the war in Syria and uh, helping Assad. And you know, we always say that after the war in 2006 with Israel, Hezbollah was very busy in rebuilding its capabilities. And then uh, there was a civil war in Syria. And when the civil war in Syria in most places ended in 2018, Hezbollah you know, was prepared, but then Israel exposed the tunnels and then there was COVID. So all the time something was happening that you know, made Hezbollah preoccupied with something else, but at the same time, its preparedness for war and for conflict with the state of Israel became better and better. And we've seen the development of that as well with regard to the rockets infrastructure, the human shield, tactic and of course uh, the, the offensive land capabilities of these commando units named Radwan Brigades, by the way, we published a report about that as well, uh, which the plan was to send them underground with the tunnels and after they were exposed, they planned to send them above the ground. Uh, more difficult, but possible. And this evolution of, of the organization itself brings us to the question today. So what's next? How can you keep so many military operatives uh, bored? You, you need to give them a meaning. You need to justify your existence. And uh, a land border dispute or disputes is a very good excuse to fuel this conflict. But actually, you know, I want to zoom out. And I don't want to focus just on Hezbollah because I believe, and as, as I've started, is that Actually, decision making is not being is not been is not happening only in Beirut. It is actually happening also in Tehran and maybe mostly in Tehran. And here we also see uh, a lot of things that are happening that may contribute to the self confidence of the Iranians on one hand, and on the other hand, to their motivation to draw the Israeli military attention, if you like, from uh, Iran nuclear program to Lebanon. Uh, put, in, put in all the efforts over there. So that's one thing. Second, of course, is the, um, the, the achievements of Iran in the Middle East, in Syria, in Yemen, the fact that uh, Syria was accepted back to the Arab League, the fact that there is a normalization agreement uh, with Saudi Arabia. With all the troubles, they didn't become friend or anything, but uh, the Iranians actually established their presence in Yemen. They established their presence in Syria, in Iraq, of course. Uh, and there is kind of a status quo now in these countries that, that accept the, the presence of Iran and the involvement of Iran in these places. I mentioned in brief the nuclear issue, Iran made a huge progress. It didn't pay any price. Uh, in, in the Iranian point of view, there is kind of weakness uh, of the international and the West, adding to all of that the war in Ukraine and the fact that Iran is now uh, manufacturing and providing drones that are attacking in Ukraine uh, to Russia. Uh, again, uh, contributing to its uh, feeling of, of supremacy of uh, uh, progress. And two more things, yes, into an internal situation in Israel and in Lebanon can contribute to everything I've just said, but it doesn't stand alone. As I've said before, the, the change in the policy of Hezbollah started before uh, the internal crisis in, in Israel. And as for the internal crisis in Lebanon and the economic crisis in Lebanon, maybe they got to the point now that they have nothing to lose or very little to lose. And it's an open question. I'm keeping this question open also because of the gas issue. Bottom line, bottom line, I have my minute, I know. Bottom line is what does Hezbollah want? Does it, is it interested in war? I think I, I portrayed a lot of reasons why it may be. Uh, is it interested in, in escalation? 
maybe maybe believing that you know calculating pros and cons and uh, more terrorist attacks will not drag drag it into war with Israel. I, I can tell you as a researcher that it is really difficult to this to, to you know to make an evaluation that will say okay I'm positive 100 in this scenario or another but uh, the bottom line is that there is different risk, risk management going on on the Israeli-Lebanese border. And uh, today Hezbollah is willing to escalate the situation here and willing to take more risks. So a year ago, it was for the maritime border dispute. Now we see this around the land uh, border disputes. And it's an open question whether all of that is to drag us into war or just to gain uh, as many achievements as possible, including achievements that are all about the Israeli resilience with regard to terrorist attacks on the border. So I think I can stop uh, over here and we can move forward to the Q&A. Uh, Uh, this uh, black line uh, defines the Lebanese versions of what is Sheba Farms. Uh, and it's, in, it's again, today this territory is under Israeli hands since 1967. Mm. It was taken from Syria in 1967, but the Lebanese today claim that it is a part of Lebanon. The reason that this is happening is, apart from, as I've said, the excuse for Hezbollah to fuel the conflict, the reason that there is kind of this kind of dispute is because French mandate 100 years ago didn't mark the border between uh, Lebanese French mandate and Syrian French mandate. By the way, in opposed to the rest of the border here, which is French mandate versus British mandate, which was marked uh, in the on the terrain, was marked you know physically on the terrain on the border, and and it just. Part of these marks were lost in, in the past century. And that's why there are still reservations around it. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Uh, British-based international lawyer, Andrew Rosemarine asks, uh, Israel's fighting a full-scale scale war against the terrorist Hezbollah now before the, before the Knesset reconvenes would give uh, Netanyahu a chance of restoring his waning popularity. Do you think that he himself would want such a war now before Knesset reconvenes? I can't believe so. Uh, as far as we know, Netanyahu is uh, very much afraid of the conflict, any conflict, by the way. Sometimes his de decisions uh, preserving status quo in different topics uh, of Israel's security and other issues uh, were not, I'll put it in another statement, were not very good decisions. Uh, I can say that Israel made it very clear that we are not interested in war. Uh, if we were interested in taking any small risks around it, I think that the issue of the tents was, was resolved in a different way, meaning that we would have sent the IDF to take them off. And we didn't do that. We chose the diplomatic way, which, by the way, I personally think it was a mistake. But this was the Israeli government decision to go to the diplomatic path rather than to send the IDF to take off the tents. I think this is a very clear message that Israel is not interested in war and Netanyahu is not going in this direction. Thank you. Richard Galber asks, uh, how has the internal political chaos inside Israel influenced Hezbollah? Well, I can, as I've said, I can't say that this is influencing already, uh, definitely influencing when we speak about propaganda, when we speak about PR, when we speak about warding, okay? Um, this is happening, Asrana talked about it, it is happening in social media, we're talking a lot about the Israeli weakness, but when we speak about policy, the policy changed earlier than that, and uh, things are happening earlier than that, there is kind of escalation in the past few months, but I'm not sure the only connection is the Israeli internal uh, crisis. And I will tell you why, because I think that eventually, I'm saying that as a former intelligence officer, uh, if you want to get an intelligent uh, assessment of your enemy, you need to combine intentions with capabilities. We're not there yet, 
maybe it will be tomorrow morning. We are still waiting for the head chief of staff to tell us whether there was uh, actual damage in the uh, capability and preparedness of the IDF. If this will be the evaluation, I guess that it will influence more uh, on the Hezbollah uh, perception of the state of the world. Thank you so much. So speaking of intelligence, uh, you mentioned that uh, Hezbollah operatives have uh, taken photos of you while while you were observing them. Uh, do you ever feel like you're personally being targeted because of this? First, I do have a feeling that I'm personally being targeted, not specifically because of this, because I am personally being targeted. Uh, we get uh, cyber attacks here all the time, uh, fake in invitations to uh, conferences outside of Israel, uh, trying to get our intimate opinion about uh, uh, documents that were stolen from other think tanks around the globe and in Israel. And uh, things are happening here. So uh, Alma Center is uh, viewed uh, on the other side as the spine center of uh, Israel in Northern Israel, though we are an independent organization and we don't get a penny from the Israeli government. We, don't, we also don't ask. I don't know whether the, the specific a combatant who was taking photos of me is, is aware of who I am. I truly don't know because he's taking photos of IDF soldiers and he's taking photos of uh, groups that he sees on the board. Uh, but I am on the border almost every day with a group and binoculars. So definitely it looks suspicious to me. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Larry Greenberg asks, if attacked, is Israel willing to utterly destroy the Lebanese Hezbollah state? And does Nasrallah believe this? The second question is the $1 million question, as I addressed before. Does Nasrallah believe this? Uh, I'm not sure. You know, In the Said Alma Center, we have various uh, evaluations around that. Uh, is Israel willing uh, Israel is never willing to to go to war. Uh, you know, we, we understand the cost of war. Definitely, a war with Lebanon, and uh, the damage will be high for both sides. IDF assessments are talking about four thousand rockets a day that Hezbollah is capable of launching into Israel. This would mean that Iron Dome is not going to be enough, and some of them will fall in populated areas, and our rescue forces will have to to stretch their their capabilities. And the same will happen in Lebanon because these Rockets are hidden in, in populated areas inside the homes and, and, and civilian infrastructures. So are we willing to go all the way? If we'll have to, we'll do that. But as, as the Israeli policy looks like now, we're doing everything we can to avoid it or at least to postpone it as much as possible. Absolutely. And on that note, what exactly are the steps being taken to postpone or avoid uh, war going forward? Well, how much time do you have? I think I want to start from <laughs> I want to start from responses. Okay, I described so many provocations and terrorist attacks, and what were the responses to all of that? Uh, I I mentioned going the diplomatic path with the tanks. Uh, Thirty six rockets that were launched on Passover eventually were met with a very very limited response, and mainly putting their responsibility on on Hamas in Lebanon rather than on Hezbollah. Um, responses, the Israeli responses are very strict and limited until today. Uh, another thing is building the wall. Uh, uh, maybe to prevent thing, but also in preventing it with, you know, creating the impression that to cross a wall is more difficult, but it's not preventing them from crossing completely. Well, they, they will decide to cross the wall when enable us to detain uh, the combatants. Um, as a resident of the Galilee, I would say that not enough is being made uh, to protect us. Uh, we don't have enough shelters. And, um, the home front is not uh, prepared enough. And I think also the, the, the Israelis, the citizens of Israel, are not are living in kind of denial. You know, uh, most of us don't have shelters at home. If we do, uh, it, it's not it's not a, equipped to to long stay like it is in, for, the, for the people in the south. Thank you. Marie Feldman follows up with this. It seems like reactive deterrence is not working. Is Israel ready to be proactive? Uh, I don't know what you mean by reactive deterrence. Uh, is Israel willing to be proactive? Are we going to initiate the war? I don't believe so. Uh, if this will happen, 
Uh, it means that Hezbollah crossed some red lines that we that it's hard to even imagine now. Uh, if we are willing to uh, be much more proactive, if people will get hurt, probably yes. Um, we were very lucky that it only in all these incidents that I've just described, nobody was was hurt. And I don't know what would have happened if, if people were, were to be killed in these uh, incidents. Um, look, there was two weeks ago, there was a, an Israeli cabinet meeting. And I believe that what was discussed in this meeting is exactly this question. How do you balance, uh, you know, uh, postponing the war uh, with, with deterrence, with the need to, to send a clear message to Hezbollah and creating kind of... Uh, responses and scenarios uh, to different to different kind of scenarios. But uh, we as Israelis, we don't know what was decided in this meeting, but we understand that of course there are strict plans of what to do and how to respond to various scenarios. Thank you. So you mentioned that in the northern border, uh, there there aren't enough shelters and long term ones. What do you think that the IDF needs to do in order to fully prepare, just in case there is conflict on the northern border? The IDF had seventeen years to be fully prepared, and I think that first, again, I'm saying that as a, a former officer in the army, lieutenant colonel, uh, you are never fully prepared. Okay doesn't matter how if you have a century you are never fully prepared but uh, at the same time of course uh, we had tons of exercises and drills uh, during the years the technology was advanced uh, greatly the connection between the different uh, units on the ground in the air intelligence looks completely different the whole the whole uh, campaign of war will look completely different if we compare it to 2006 uh, the intelligence is much better. We know where the rockets are. Um, yes, the defense ministry didn't allocate the, the needed budgets for building the shelters. This is not happening yet. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Ken Miller asks, if a war with Hezbollah does break up, uh, another one based on the use of missiles being launched from inside Lebanon and possibly, possibly Syria, what are the chances that the Russians would provide air support and cover to defend against Israeli air responses? Um, until today, it didn't happen. <laughs> well, if it happened, it happened because Russians were affected by Israeli attacks in Syria or blamed Israel for attacking in Syria. Uh, and it was in very, very specific cases, in very, very few cases comparing to the amount of attacks that were carried out in Syria in the past decade uh, due to the Syrians' reports themselves. So uh, I, uh, the, the, the Russians are not willing to, you know, to uh, we say in Hebrew, to lie on the fence, meaning to die for anybody. Okay, uh, they only want to defend their own interests. As, as long as Israel will not uh, go against uh, directly uh, the Russian interest or, uh, you know, killing Russian soldiers, I don't think that Russia would want to be involved in all this mess. Thank you. Uh, Larry Greenberg asks, Israel uh, will be condemned even if it retaliates to a significant attack. Why keep making concessions to enemies who are not only not deterred, but who have no intention of honoring agreements? Well, first, it is a political question. Uh, but more than a political question, I think the answer is, that we know the cost of war, uh, you know, I guess you are in Washington or New York or Chicago or I don't know where. We are 12 kilometers from Hezbollah. And if there will be war, it's our kids that will participate. Okay, in Alma Center, we are three parents, two soldiers. We, we cannot be interested in war in this kind of situation. Absolutely. And it's easy to ask those questions sitting here in uh, Philadelphia, but you're you're right there on the front lines there. Um, so before we go, can you please tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work and especially on the Alma Center? Yes. Yeah, so what I'll do, I'll share with you the link to the report I've mentioned. But of course, uh, from there, you can go anywhere in the website. 
Uh, we are also all over social media, uh, whether it's uh, Twitter, uh, I'll put it in the chat, okay? Um, I'll put it in the chat if you can transfer it for everybody because I don't have the permission. I uh, would appreciate that. Um, you can find us everywhere on social media and uh, you can also subscribe through the website. You can easily subscribe to get our weekly newsletter where you can get everything that we publish and also some word uh, some words for, for myself, kind of my therapy, a weekly therapy of writing about what's going on here in my neighborhood. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Mrs. Zahavi, for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. And for our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update with Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.